This is Sri Lanka, a small island nation off the coast of India home to just 22 million people. The country's economy has a lot going for it. It has a relatively skilled and literate population when compared to its direct geographic neighbours, it has highly fertile land, beautiful beaches and rainforests for tourists, and even strong natural resource wealth, with almost a quarter of the nation's landmass being covered in valuable gemstones like sapphires and rubies. These industries were part of the reason why Sri Lanka was one of the fastest growing economies in the region in the late 2000s and early 2010s, and that's a region that was full of very fast growing economies. But of course, as many of you are probably aware, that growth did not last, and earlier this year the country was plunged into a debt crisis that spiralled into a full blown humanitarian crisis, with the country's citizens being unable to afford basic necessities like food, fuel and medicine. The path to Sri Lanka's collapse is riddled with mistakes that economists can learn a lot from to avoid being repeated in their own economies, but the country's journey can give us some insight into a potentially more concerning trend. For the past four decades, most economists have been working off the assumption that all nations can transition from undeveloped agrarian economies to developing manufacturing based economies, and then finally on to self sufficient service based economies like those in the West. There are examples like South Korea, Taiwan and even Japan that have made this economic journey in the past century, not to mention the countries in North America and Western Europe that ultimately made this transition during the Industrial Revolution. The assumption that all countries are just waiting for their turn to get rich is something that a lot of regular people and even highly educated economists subscribe to, but just a few seconds of critical thinking will make you realise that this is about as silly as saying that every individual within an economy can get rich. The story of Sri Lanka's rise and fall might be the most clear demonstration that the global economy only has so much room at the top, and that becoming an advanced economy is by no means guaranteed just because a nation adopts a market system and starts doing lots of international trade. In fact, the very structure of our modern global economy really depends on a level of inequality that most people might not be very comfortable with. So. How did Sri Lanka go from being one of the fastest growing economies in the world to a complete economic failure within the span of two decades? How does this demonstrate that it's not possible for all nations to eventually become advanced economies? And finally, is it possible for Sri Lanka to recover from this current collapse and regain the improving living standards they were enjoying prior to 2020? Once we have done all of that, we can put Sri Lanka on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. This episode of Economics Explained is brought to you by ShipStation. How many times have you gone to place an order online only to get to the checkout and give up entirely when you see how much it's going to cost you to ship something? It's bad for you as a customer, but even worse for the business that just missed out on making a sale. Shipping costs are the number one cause of abandoned carts for businesses handling orders through the internet. ShipStation fixes that problem by handling shipping for your orders for every marketplace in one dashboard, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify and more. ShipStation gives your business an intuitive dashboard to monitor, track and automate shipping tasks. If that wasn't enough, their industry leading discounts means that your business can get up to 84% off USPS and UPS shipping rates, which means that you'll never have to worry about paying for shipping and losing an order at the last step ever again. Running an online business is difficult, but ShipStation is there to give you a competitive edge, which is why 98% of the companies that have used the service for the first year end up becoming ShipStation customers for life. The best part is that you can try it out completely risk free by going to shipstation.com slash economic today for a free 60 day trial. The economy of Sri Lanka as it exists today really started in the late 2000s with the Sri Lankan government claiming victory over the LTTE, which was a separatist military organisation that fought to create an independent state in the north of the country. In 2009 the organisation was declared totally defeated and the now completely unified country started investing heavily in its growth. As we've already explored, the country had a lot going for it and now without the threat of armed conflict it was truly able to exploit these advantages. Tourism slowly increased as visitors from around the world came to enjoy the country's exotic culture and pristine natural environments. Gemstone mining picked up and only worked to accelerate tourists interest in visiting the country, agriculture expanded, especially with the production of world renowned tea products, and the country was also able to fully take advantage of its greatest natural resource, its people. Sri Lanka has a well developed education system with literacy rates above most developing countries, which means it became a popular destination for outsourced service work. Offshore call centres and IT operations might not be glamorous roles to countries in the west, but they are incredibly lucrative for the developing countries providing these services because they bring money into an economy in a totally sustainable way without having to export finite natural resources. The skilled workers of Sri Lanka also generated income from the country by working abroad as skilled expats and sending money as remittances back home to their family. 
We have explored the benefits and drawbacks of international remittances quite recently in our video on migrant labour, so I don't want to repeat too much here, but this source of cash turned out to be both a blessing and a curse for Sri Lanka. The growth in the country's economy following the end of the 26 year civil war was intense, but it was also doomed from the start. The government invested heavily into non-tradable industries and by extension encouraged private businesses to do the same. Non-tradable industries are things like domestic education, healthcare, government services, construction and retail. Basically, industries that produce products that can't be traded internationally. These industries are incredibly important, but a small developing economy like Sri Lanka is going to run into a lot of problems basing its growth off these industries alone. Achieving GDP growth through investment into things like infrastructure is very easy. Big projects like this require a lot of spending and employ a lot of workers. Construction projects also tend to use a lot of domestic products because construction materials like cement and gravel are too heavy and cheap to ship internationally. So infrastructure spending is a great way to get money into an economy and make sure it stays in that economy. Infrastructure spending also has the small little added benefit of, you know, actually providing infrastructure. Roads, railways, ports, electric grids and everything else that goes into an infrastructure budget can make businesses and workers more efficient, leading to more output and ultimately more tax revenue to pay for more infrastructure. The problem is that infrastructure spending only works up until the point where the economy can fully utilise the efficiency gains from additional pieces of infrastructure. Spending money on infrastructure above and beyond the capacity of an economy is like a small business owner having a good year and convincing themselves that they need an inner city office to allow for further expansion. If the business genuinely needed the space for more employees, then this might be a good investment. But if a bigger office is not something that is desperately needed by the business, it's obviously silly to think that a big office is somehow going to generate growth just by itself. That should be obvious to basically anybody, but for some reason when we scale this example up to the level of a national economy, people seem to think that just building out infrastructure will somehow generate economic growth after the direct stimulus to pay for the projects themselves. Certain economies, like the resource-rich Gulf states, can get away with this kind of reckless spending, and so too can rapidly expanding nations like China, because their industrial output is growing at such a rate that indiscriminate building was really the only way to keep up. But you can't build a port and expect to become a trading superpower. You need to develop trading businesses and then supply them with the infrastructure as they need it. Even China is starting to realise this now. For countries like Sri Lanka, it was much worse because all of this spending on flashy infrastructure to make them look like an advanced economy was being funded by debt taken on as a developing economy. Government spending was very lucrative for a lot of the population who took up jobs directly supported by these projects, but that meant that the economy neglected the tradable industries that could actually support the economy in the medium to long term. Eventually, Sri Lanka had run into a simple problem. In the process of building out their economy, they had gone into debt and had more money going out to pay off loans and buy imports to support the local population than they had money coming in from exports and other payments. But here is where things get interesting. There are lots of countries in the world that import more than they export, and most of them are doing just fine. If you really think about it, it's impossible for all countries to export more than they import, unless we were just dumping shipping containers in the ocean. The United States, along with a lot of other advanced economies, has a huge balance of trade deficit. And despite what some people will say, that's just fine, because there is more than one way that money can come into an economy, and economists track this using the balance of payments. The balance of payments is broken up into two separate accounts, the current account and the capital and financial account. These two accounts are always of equal value, hence the name balance of payments. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down with the details of these accounts because really all that's important is to understand how cash can come into and get out of an economy. The easiest to understand is trade. If an economy exports more than it imports, it will have money inflows. If an economy exports less than it imports, it will have money outflows. An important point of note here with imports and exports is that this equation also includes the import and export of services. For example, if an American company pays a Sri Lankan company for IT consulting, then that would be a service import for the USA and a service export for Sri Lanka. Just like regular imports and exports, the money flows from the importer to the exporter. The only reason that this can get confusing is that services are much harder to visualise leaving the country than stuff that gets packed into freighters. Another way an economy can make money is by receiving investments from abroad. These investments can either be loans or direct purchases of assets, for example a British investor buying shares in an American company. Economies can also have cash outflows the same way if investors within the country are investing abroad, so normally economists track net foreign investments. 
And if they want to get really technical, they'll break this down into foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment. Foreign portfolio investment is when a foreign investor puts money into an asset that they don't have direct control over. For example, if an Australian buys shares of Apple, they won't have any direct control over the company outside of their proportional vote and shareholder decisions. Foreign direct investment is therefore when a foreign investor puts money into an asset that they do have direct control over. Most foreign direct investment is made up of real estate purchases because when people buy a house, they almost always buy the whole thing and have a direct say over what they do with that property. Foreign direct investment can however happen on a much larger scale, with foreign investors purchasing entire companies or even pieces of infrastructure. Normally foreign portfolio investment is preferred by the host country because it means that the economy and its people maintain control over their assets but can still raise money from abroad. Either way, if an economy has net positive foreign investment, it will have an inflow of cash coming from foreign investors and that can offset the money that they lose by importing more than they export. However, the problem with this is that eventually those investors will want to withdraw their money from their investments either through rents, dividends, interest or from just selling the asset. When they transfer this money back to themselves in their home country, there will be cash outflow from the host economy. Of course, again, the opposite is also true and there are lots of economies that have massive investment inflows. Norway with its trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund receives money from all over the world every year thanks to its foreign investments. Another way a country can bring cash into its economy is through remittances. This is when workers will go abroad and send money back to their family at home. As much as 5% of the world's workforce works outside of their home country, so this can be a significant source of revenue, especially for lower income countries with a lot of workers seeking opportunities abroad, like Sri Lanka. Finally, there is foreign aid. Global foreign aid now accounts for more than $161 billion annually. Although this is increasingly coming in the form of physical assistance, like sending ships full of food, medicine and equipment, rather than sending money directly and hoping that an impoverished country's leadership does the right thing with it because, well, they often don't. Now, by looking at all of these categories, we can see that it is possible for countries to run out of money. Even the United States, which has the distinct advantage of being able to print the world's reserve currency, still has to make sure that they don't have endless currency outflows or else the American dollar could rapidly lose its value and its unofficial status as the world's currency for international trade and finance. A lot of economies, particularly advanced economies, can get around this problem by having foreign investments that cover their balance of trade deficits. I've used this example before, but a company like Apple will oversee operations that takes lithium from Brazil, ships it on a Greek freighter to be turned into batteries in Taiwan, that will then be sent to factories in China where they are used to make iPhones that are then sold to a German in Berlin. At no point did the United States directly contribute anything to this hypothetical supply chain, but an American company will make the profit from it and America itself will enjoy the tax revenue and most of the highest paying jobs that come from this process. For economies that don't have the luxury of large international corporations or investments, they run into the same problem as most individuals. They can run out of money. This was the problem that Sri Lanka was having and it's perhaps the perfect demonstration that not all countries can get rich. Sri Lanka was importing more than it was exporting and it was making up this deficit by attracting foreign investment. The only problem was that this foreign investment was coming mainly in the form of loans rather than equity investments that took a stake in assets like a business or an infrastructure project. Loans need to be repaid no matter if the economy is doing well, whereas foreign investors that purchase ownership in something also accept the risk that that asset might make no returns during bad periods. Loans to developing countries like Sri Lanka also come with higher interest rates, and loans to countries that are only just getting out of a two and a half decade long civil war are also seen as riskier and therefore demand an even higher interest rate. The loans to Sri Lankan businesses and the governments demanded large interest payments be made back every year to the countries that they were borrowing from, so Sri Lanka was losing money from exports and investment returns simultaneously, while the borrowed money itself was mostly being used to buy stuff that the country didn't need to expand its industry. This situation was bad, and the country was almost inevitably on a path to complete economic collapse. And then along came the pandemic, which only accelerated this process. In the early stages of the pandemic, international finance dried up because institutions wanted to hold on to their cash instead of loaning it out to risky regions like Sri Lanka. The country's tourism industry, which was once a growing source of cash from abroad, came to a complete stop and remittances dried up as the country's overseas workers either had to return back home or work fewer hours in industries that were heavily affected by lockdowns. Basically, the country was already spending more than it made and was just barely being kept afloat by a combination of its few income generating industries and taking on more loans. 
When the pandemic rolled around, it lost those few sources of income and also lost access to the loans that it could have used to ride out the economic turbulence. It, however, did not lose its financial obligations to keep on paying all of their expenses. By mid-2022, the country had no money left and nobody would accept its domestic currency because inflation and instability destroyed its value in foreign exchange markets. The country ran out of money and had no way to pay for things like machinery, medicine or even food, which it had become dependent on importing. This disaster was compounded by bizarre political moves like the government's decision to ban the use of fertilisers to force the nation's farmers to become 100% organic. This change cut food production in half and made it up to 10 times more expensive to grow the same amount of produce, which meant agricultural exports like tea were no longer profitable and a country already struggling with food insecurity made it much more difficult to grow food. In reality, this decision may not have had as big an impact as people think because all of Sri Lanka's fertilisers and pesticides were imported anyway and they were running out of money to pay for these supplies. In fact, part of the reason that the government enacted this ban was so that they would stop losing the $400 million a year that they were sending abroad to pay for these supplies. Sri Lanka's economy is going to need to be built from the ground up, and this has increasingly become the story of a lot of economies on the rise. Transitioning from an undeveloped to a developing and ultimately onto an advanced economy requires a lot of things to go right. It requires the development of a healthy domestic market, the training of a skilled workforce, competitive industries and institutions that can add value beyond the country's borders. And these elements all need to be nurtured in a stable environment. These components also all require some level of investment, which is difficult to ask. As an investor, there is little incentive to invest into a country like Sri Lanka. It's unstable, it's had a bad history of repaying its loans, and the upsides are limited even if the investment goes very well. Their labour force is small and only getting smaller as skilled workers are increasingly looking for opportunities abroad where they can earn up to 10 times as much as they can at home. And the country doesn't have much in the way of natural resources beyond gemstones. These days, there is also an enormous amount of competition in the global economy for all of the industries that a country like Sri Lanka may have a competitive advantage in. Why would a company set up low-cost operations in Sri Lanka when India is right next door with a labour force 50 times larger? The only chance an economy like this has to attract the investment it needs to get off the ground is by offering really high interest rates and putting up collateral. If the country is paying double-digit interest rates on its loans, the investments it makes into building its economy would need to be remarkable just to cover the interest. Of course, this situation is not unique to Sri Lanka, and we are increasingly seeing countries struggle to make the same sort of transitions as Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, and other big winners of the past few decades. Unfortunately, given our current systems, the world simply does not have enough resources to support every country becoming an advanced economy and enjoying the way of life that comes with it. And that reality will continue to create situations like the one Sri Lanka now has to recover from. Okay, now it's time to put Sri Lanka on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. Starting as always with size, Sri Lanka has a GDP of just under $84.5 billion as of 2021, which is the latest year that the World Bank has figures for. 2022 is going to be significantly lower than this due to the economic turbulence plaguing the nation, but for now it gets a 3 out of 10. That GDP is spread out over a population of 22 million, giving the country a GDP per capita of $3,814, which is barely over a third of the global average. Again, this is bound to be significantly lower in 2022, but it still only gives the country a 3 out of 10. Stability and confidence is very low. Political tensions still run high, the country has no financial reserves, and it's heavily dependent on other countries for everything it needs to operate. It gets a 2 out of 10, but keep in mind that a score of 1 or 0 means that the country is either in active revolution or deep in civil war. Growth is the reason that I made this video to begin with. Since the year 2000, Sri Lanka's economy has become five times larger, and it's 50% larger than it was a decade ago, again, before considering this year's downturn. With such strong growth, it would be easy to see why businesses and the government were building out infrastructure in anticipation for the time when the economy would grow into it. And had everything gone perfectly, we may very well have been making a video about Sri Lanka's genius domestic investments that let it maintain its trajectory as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. But the economy does still get a 7 out of 10. Finally, industry. This was the real problem with Sri Lanka, which was that it wasn't able to develop industries that would be competitive in the global economy it was trying to become a part of. Tourism and services, the two things that the country did have going for it, are only going to suffer more now that the first thing that people think of when they think of Sri Lanka is not relaxing around a resort swimming pool, but citizens riding around their fleeing Prime Minister's swimming pool. Sri Lanka gets a 2 out of 10. 
Altogether, that gives Sri Lanka an average score of 3.4 out of 10, which puts it down here on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.